Welcome back to the FinCEN Report podcast. I'm Jonathan Wilson. I'm one of the co-founders of FinCENReport.com. And we have a great guest today. His name is Klaus Christensen, and he is the founder and CEO of KnowYourCustomer.com. Uh, KnowYourCustomer.com is a solution provider in the fintech space. Uh, it is a modular system of compliance programs uh, that banks use to manage their KYC and customer due diligence information. We're going to talk about how their software works, how it relates to AML compliance in general, and some of the possible implications it has for the Corporate Transparency Act here in the United States. So stay, stay tuned to uh, hear our conversation with Klaus Christensen. So Klaus Christensen, welcome. Uh, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. So why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself and about your company? Well, let me start. I'm originally from Hamburg, Germany. But my wife is Irish, so I ended up living in Dublin, in Ireland. Lovely. I love it here. Uh, the people are extremely friendly. And Ireland is very open to the world with connections everywhere. That is in the soul of the Irish. Mm -hmm. And my original hometown, Hamburg, is a big port city uh, with that same outward looking attitude. And that's something I value a lot. Um, now, I got to, I'm going to ask, as, a, as yeah. a beer connoisseur, great German beers, I'm also a fan of Guinness. You know, has the move to Ireland changed your perspective on beer at all? It certainly did, yes. I okay. would not have uh, had any Guinness before moving to Ireland, but a freshly done get pint of Guinness here is, uh, is a really nice thing. And the pop culture is great here. It is something very low-key. It's something you do with friends. Um, with family even, and uh, that is not so much about drinking as it is in, in uh, Germany. Uh, always enjoyed that here, uh, but part, yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. Sure. I don't spend that much time here, though, I have to admit, uh, since a good portion of um, our businesses, uh, KYC is actually in Asia. You, you do travel a lot. I know in, in talking to you before we got started today, it was always, well, I'm off to here and I'm off to there. So we're, we're going to have to to, to hear about that, but what exactly is knowyourcustomer.com and, and what does your company do? Well, we built this compliance solution for corporate onboarding. We concentrate on the onboarding for financial institutions under anti-money regulations of corporate entities. And that is a lot more difficult and more challenging than uh, individuals. You and I as individuals, we don't change our identity. Uh, we stay with our names and we stay with our identities. Our date of birth doesn't change. Our nationality could uh, sometimes, but it's very rare. Uh, our passport or ID card might expire and we have to change that, but our identity changed the same. That's not the same for corporates. First of all, a corporate identity is more complex. There is uh, beneficial owners, there is uh, controlling entities, and then there's the entity itself uh, with its creation date and its uh, subsidiaries and so on. Uh, on the other side, it's also dynamic. Uh, a business can change parts of its identity any business day. It can change a new shareholder. It can change a director or corporate secretary and such. That makes it a lot more challenging and a lot more interesting for businesses as, as we are uh, to help financial institutions with that onboarding. Sure. So what we build is a um, modular compliance solution that connects automatically to company registries as the ultimate source of truth about corporate entities. It downloads the documents that you need, normally would request from your new clients, and it reads them as well with a lot of AI and a good bit of algorithms that we build ourselves to convert these documents into structured data. That, mm -hmm does not work uh, all over the world uh, in every country because, as we know, some countries are more um, privacy conscious, uh, others are more transparency oriented. But where it works, it works spectacularly well as a base for every onboarding decision. Sure. Now, company registries, we were talking before we got started, is a concept that's a little bit foreign to our U.S. audience, why don't you describe for American listeners what a company registry is as you experience it in, in Europe, for example? You do have company registries, obviously, in the U.S. as well. Um, the difference is twofold. First of all, in the U.S., you have the company registries on the state level. There's no country uh, com company registry. 
In Europe, uh, where the regulation about this is extremely strong and extreme, extremely uh, transparent, um, the situation is a bit different. First of all, every company has to register with their local company registry and their local country, but the registries publish this information. Mm -hmm. So not just the fact that this company exists, it's registered address, but also information about the, uh, the corporate structure, uh, the beneficial owners and the controlling entities. For example, Irish or UK companies have directors. That's the board. Mm -hmm. The board needs to be published as with the names and nationalities and date of births in the official public company registry. The same thing is every year, uh, all the private limited companies equivalent to um, LLCs in um, the US need to publish a paper called the annual return. And on the annual return, there's a list of current shareholders. Mm -hmm. So both the shareholder information and the director information is public in Europe. And that is by design. Uh, that has actually changed. I remember it used to be in the 80s, 90s, there was, um, the, the situation was more similar to the US. This was private information. It was not public, but over time in the EU, we took over this more um, Scandinavian approach of transparency over privacy for this information. Mm -hmm. And the result is now that our anti-money laundering regulations state that this information needs to be submitted to the company registries on time in a timely manner, and it needs to be public, fully public, as yes. in the press or any private citizen can look up the beneficial owners of any company in the EU by just going to the company registry and requesting it. Sure. And is there some uh, level of materiality for a shareholder to appear in that annual return? For example, does does the smallest shareholder with less than 1% holdings still appear in the annual return? I believe there may be uh, local regulations that implement that differently. That's one of the intricacies of uh, the EU. The EU isn't a country, as we know. So in the EU, the um, regulations really come from the European Parliament. In anti-money laundering, there's an AML directive that instructs the local uh, governments of all the member countries to implement an AML law or regulations that are, is compatible overall um, to arrive at a situation where the AML regulations are roughly similar. I think that's a good idea. In any case, they are implemented slightly differently. But no, in most countries, there is no limit there. So even if, uh, like in our country, we have an uh, we have a, in our company, we have shareholders that only have one share. It's like um, part of our staff, they got a reward in, in shares maybe. And even they are on the list. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that is something that I'm sure uh, is uh, surprising to our American audience. Because one of the things you hear when you describe the new Corporate Transparency Act to American business owners is, well, surely that's an invasion of my privacy. How can the government know who the shareholders of my company are. I, I would never give out that information. And so it's, it's, it's a whole new experience over here with our, our Corporate Transparency Act. I, I totally get that. And I uh, appreciate the differences in cultural approaches. That is just different in Europe and America. Uh, in the US, uh, it is just nobody's business who owns a company except the owners. And I understand that uh, as, a, as an individual and a company owner, I actually would appreciate more privacy in, in some ways there. Um, but of course, uh, growing up here in the European system, I do appreciate um, what transparency does. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the question is, is the CTA in its present form as effective as it could be? As a European, from a European perspective, mm -hmm. I would say mm, it's kind of limited at the moment. It could be more, but it may be more. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I, I, you know, we still haven't gotten the final regulations from no. Pinsden about how people and law enforcement and banks are going to access this data once it's all collected. Yeah, uh, it's supposed to be confidential, but it's accessible by law enforcement, accessible by banks, 
accessible by non-U.S. law enforcement, which is something that gets people excited. Um, yeah. I, I, I suppose in your view, it would be more effective to counter money laundering if that registry, uh, well, if, if the FinCEN database were public like a European registry. Ultimately, yes. I, I do understand the cultural difference, as I said, uh, but that is the, I think it limits effectiveness because if you aren't transparent at that level, it's that much simpler to submit erroneous information, let's say, to the register. If nobody sees it ever, except a bank and law enforcement, if they look um, and if I give my consent to the bank, because the banks, even the banks is consent uh, driven, I believe, um, then it's it's a lot easier to submit something or not submit some information, maybe not mention another beneficial owner that would be dodgy mm -hmm. um, in the filing because nobody's ever going to see except if I consent or except if some law uh, um conflict comes up for for my company and as long as that doesn't happen it's it's unlikely to be found out it's very different in europe if it's all public uh things are found out easier the light of uh transparency can can highlight these instances much much faster yeah and i suppose your company selling this modular solution for aml compliance to banks you view banks banks as being your customers they're they're the ones who contract with you and they pay you um, without asking for anything proprietary. How, how is your software priced? Are, are, your, are your banks paying you, you know, per transaction or per user or on some other basis? Yeah, we do actually have a, a dual fee structure. There is an annual license fee uh, for running the platform and connecting and um, doing support and all sorts. Um, but there's a per KYC case fee. So you could call it transactional, but it is really reoccurring because usually financial institutions have the same sort of volume of onboardings and crucially also the same sort of volume in re-KYC after a period of time. Um, every month or every quarter, there's, there might be a, a bit of a... Um, an up and down over the months, but uh, usually it would in longer periods the same. So that's how we price it. Sure. And I'm, uh, I'm taking this somewhere, but uh, how often uh, do most banks need to reconfirm the accuracy of their KYC data? Is that a function of their national bank regulatory regime or is it something else? No, it is. It is uh, to a degree it's, it's by regulation, but I, don't, I'm not aware actually of regulation that specifically states the exact number of years. Um, it all comes down to the risk-based approach of mm. compliance. And uh, that ultimately comes from the global uh, the origin of most regulations in our field, AML and KYC, and that is with FADF, the Financial Action Task Force, yes. um, with their recommendations. They are not laws, they are not regulations, they are just recommendations how local uh, countries should implement their regulations. And that risk-based approach states that um, as you go higher risk with a client, however you arrive at a risk evaluation there, um, you should re-KYC them more often. The usual approach in most countries that we sell in is uh, a one, three, five year approach. So Ooh. if it's a high risk client, you would do it every year. If it's a lowest grind every five years, in some instances, maybe even every 10 years, uh, but 10 years is less and less used. Uh, everybody's moving to five years, it seems. And if it's a medium risk, you, you decide somewhere in between. Sure. Uh, the, now, the reason why I ask that is uh, among the many things we have in the Corporate Transparency Act that are a challenge for our U.S. audience, uh, first, we have to get them over the idea that the ownership of their company is confidential and they're going to have to provide this data to the government. The next challenge is that the CTA, as you know, requires the company to amend its report within 30 calendar days after any change in any item of previously reported data. Yeah. So that's not only a, a timing problem, but it's an information problem because we aren't accustomed for shareholders to alert their companies within 30 calendar days of a change in address or it 
uh, a renewal of the driver's license or something like that, for example. Yeah. Um, that I often thought, wouldn't it have been easier to simply require all the companies to amend the report on an annual basis? That is the approach you have in many countries in the EU. UK, Ireland would be a prime example. There's an annual return that is you have to do it every year. Same in Hong Kong and Singapore. Once a year, you report back to the company registry in that case. Mm -hmm. um, what are your current shareholders and who are your current directors? Uh, some require more um, frequent updates, actually. And generally, um, many countries are moving to more frequent updates. I remember in Hong Kong that uh, we almost got in trouble with the company registry because I had a, a new passport because my previous one was full of visas and I had to, to get a new one. And we didn't tell the company registry until 30 days or so after, but we are required to do it 14 days maximum mm -hmm. after a change in identity document. Uh, I, I don't think everybody's aware of these things and, and they will have that very, very lenient there, but yeah, it's that strict. Sure, because I, I can imagine how Congress could have made this so much easier for American businesses if they had an annual filing concept. Yeah. Here, we, we all pay our taxes on April the 15th every year, and everyone knows April the 15th. We could have made May the 15th be CTA Compliance Day, uh, but instead, with the 30-day rule, you really are requiring 30 million U.S. companies to change their governance in a way that requires a constant dynamic flow of data from shareholders to the company uh, so that the company is in a position to file the amendment when required. True, yeah, I haven't even thought about that. That that will be difficult for most of them. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, it will, as it will. Um, great. So uh, for how many years have you been uh, running knowyourcustomer.com? Almost eight years now. We started in September 2015 and uh, it has been a wild ride and, and a very, very interesting journey. Uh, running a startup company is is always interesting. Uh, running any business is interesting. Um, but for me, I always joke that I actually, I didn't run KYC for eight years. Mm -hmm. I ran eight different companies for one year because they are completely separate and different entities. Like this year, KYC this year is very different from KYC two years ago, at least. But also, yeah, really from last year, it's, it has changed so much. So eight different so companies just because each year it changes. Well, it's, it's not the regulations or anything that changed. Like it, it is our journey from starting as a startup, obviously, if you, it's a tech company um, or a, any company, you need to establish your brand at some point, which introduces a certain dynamic over time. In the very beginning, first of all, you don't have a product at all. So you first need to build the product and that may take a while. In our case, uh, almost two years really until we had a product that was um, good enough to uh, be in the market and be accepted. But even then, um, you would start and only be successful with smaller financial institutions. Remember, financial institutions are very, very, yeah, um, they're very strong in, com in compliance already. Uh, they're very set in their ways and uh, they are not easily swayed. And of course, we don't want them to because we trust them with, their mo with our money. Mm -hmm. um, but that means it's very challenging to sell to them as a startup or a smaller financial, a smaller company uh, in that area. And it took a while until we had the name and the brand recognition to be accepted by tier one banks where we are now at. So it meant in the beginning we were we had no revenue at all, and uh, we found us we had to f uh, fund the, the journey. Then we had a little revenue from smaller customers. Now we have more revenue from larger customers. And every single time that changes, uh, the demands from customers change. They are completely different beasts. If you talk to a, a tech company, in the, a fintech company, a virtual bank or challenger bank, or if you talk to a, a bank that is literally 210 years old and established in 15 jurisdictions. Uh -huh. and those those things are are interesting, and it means a change in in our company every single time. So, I can imagine. So, how many banks do you count as customers today? We have about sixty five customers. Um, I don't have the actual count of banks uh, amongst them, um, but it must be about 
12, 15 banks among these uh, customers. There are others. Uh, we are also active in the corporate services sector. Uh, they, these corporate services sector companies that incorporate and file for companies are very strong in some of the jurisdictions, like in the UK, there's a whole scene of companies creating new companies. In Hong Kong, Singapore, same thing. Uh, and they're regulated in many jurisdictions, so they need to do AML and KYC right. And then they use our tools. There's uh, brokerages, there's some um, Web3 or cryptos, but uh, mm -hmm. that has uh, slowed to a degree, mm -hmm. uh, the whole scene. Yes. And uh, there's, there's many more smaller, like lenders, and uh, then the very interesting bit, the fintechs in terms of virtual banks and in terms of payment. We have a lot of payment companies amongst our customers that use us for merchant onboarding. That is hotly contested. They want to onboard a lot new merchants to stick their um, logo on as many cash registered as possible. And so um, they want to be merchant onboarding has to be very, very smooth for payment companies. That's where we come in. Sure. And I think you said that you do a lot of traveling in Asia. So I, I imagine you have a large customer base in Asia. We do. Yes. Um, the financial um, global financial centers are number three and four in size are Singapore and Hong Kong. They actually switched places last year. Um, both are fantastic markets for a variety of reasons. Uh, first of all, they're nice and English speaking, so accessible to products that use that in marketing and so on. So you can talk to them. Um, and they are very, very dynamic because they sit in their separate environments. Hong Kong is a bit more problematic, as we all know. They, they changed a bit their role, reduced it a bit more to the uh, connection to mainland China. But that is still a very interesting role in a more segregated global world that we currently have to have this one place where things still moving. Uh, so uh, that is an interesting one, and a lot is happening there. And Singapore, obviously, is a big connection to the whole Southeast Asian region, all these smaller uh, countries that are very, very dynamic with very young populations and, and growing. And uh, so financially, uh, a lot is going through Singapore, and, and their institutions are very strong and very interested in, in modernizing things. Uh, so we've had great success over there, and that's why I do spend a lot of time in Asia. Also, it's uh, it's a nice place to visit. I have to say, I enjoy that cultural experience and uh, traveling in the region and interacting with our partners and customers there. Uh, it's very, very rewarding. Uh, not that I mind coming to the US. I do very often. Uh, there's a, a specific conferences I visit and uh, uh, there, there's a few places that I return to. Well, well, we'll we'll definitely have to to, to host you if you uh, have the opportunity to visit us in uh, in Atlanta. Um, what are the prospects for your company uh, expanding into the United States? That is actually one of our next plans. Now we'll do a bit more in Europe and uh, Southeast Asia, but the big next plan is expanding to the U.S. So we we'll set up um, offices, and uh, yeah, we should probably think about Atlanta. Anyway, it would be both coasts, east and west. Um, to connect to the financial institutions that are outward looking. I don't think our main target would be um, the very large financial sector that deals with mostly the US itself, but the ones that deal with outside companies a lot or connected to those, they need services like ours to make that journey a lot easier. And uh, so that's a big one. Um, part of that journey is fundraising, though. We're currently in um, the late stages of a fundraise. I can't say more, but uh, that is going well. Uh, with those funds, uh, the U.S. would be the very next step now. And uh, looking forward to that. Uh, maybe Money 2020 in, uh, in October in uh, Las Vegas would be a nice place to start that. We'll see. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Well, we're we're running out of time. Uh, Klaus, uh, I really have enjoyed hearing your perspectives and hearing about knowyourcustomer.com and, and your plans for growth. Well, any uh, any final thoughts on where you think uh, you know the world of anti-money laundering compliance will be in the next few years? I think the world is actually going in the right direction. Um, anti-money laundering. That's an optimistic thought. I, I, yes. I hope you're right. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm an optimistic person. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, so I, I guess that's part of it. Um, 
I think it's it's going in fits and starts as every single time people have to figure out the implications. And even in Europe, you have to figure out the privacy versus transparency thing. There have been some setbacks here as well. It's not as simple as saying, well, here everything's open and will always be. And the US uh, wants to make it more private. I think things are moving in the right direction. At least our attention is on the right things now. And um, probably the, the sanctions that happened due to um, Russia invading Ukraine, that is one big driver here that everybody is looking again at how to implement sanctions right, how to verify ownership of companies and exclude the right people. Uh, I like that the world is looking at that. And I'm uh, yeah positive about the, the uh, place we're moving towards. That's great. Well, I, I enjoy your optimism and uh, I hope that you're right. So <laughs> Thanks, love. Jonathan. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we will definitely keep in touch and hopefully you know, have you back sometime to let us know how your journey goes. Absolutely, I will. Thanks, Jonathan, for having me on the podcast. And it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. 